Ladies and gentlemen, this is David Mericatani back with Mark Ostrander and Grant Turner for another episode of Weighing In, brought to you by USA Wrestling, the national governing body for wrestling in the United States, and by Nike Wrestling. Go to athleteps.com for all of your Nike and USA Wrestling branded gear. We are recording on Monday, July 12th. Let's start with, uh, we're going to not have Grant Turner with us for the next four weeks. Grant, uh, big congrats. You're heading to Tokyo Friday doing big, big things. It's one of the reasons you're on the podcast, especially in the summertime, is your knowledge and depth of relationships in the international field. So first of all, congrats. Tell me how excited, you know, tell me and Mark how excited you are just to be a part of, literally part of the Olympics, man. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a huge honor to go represent Nike at the, you know, the largest stage in the world. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about it. We've been working really hard the past four years um, to try to, you know, move the sport forward in many different parts of the world. So supporting athletes from, you know, as many continents as I possibly can and making those connections last over the next, you know, foreseeable future is going to be a really big deal. Um, it's going to be one of the most wild, crazy Olympics ever. Just with COVID, no spectators, state of emergency, small brackets, every match is going to be exciting. And it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch, a lot of really good wrestling. So maybe I'll do some like on side reporting and call you guys at like 3 a.m. when the finals are going on or something. Do it, man. Do it. Send us video. We'll go live. <laughs> USA Wrestling would love it. <laughs> so, be like, and, one We'll yeah. get Mark out of we'll get off we'll get Mark out of his slumber. He'll go online with us. Well, at three in the morning, I'm probably okay. If it's in the middle of the afternoon, that's when it's going to be hard to get a hold of me. Because I'll be <laughs> three yeah. in your morning is your is your wheelhouse, Ostrander. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> He's up hitting the golf ball at six a.m. So, um, there you go. but seriously, man, congrats. Um, I talk to you probably weekly about other things we're doing, and just the work you're doing, spreadsheets with different countries and organizations and um i don't think i've ever said this publicly but it's probably a good time as any i think a lot of us a long time ago didn't like nike that you know like it was asics and adidas and that those were the companies we grew up with in wrestling and the perception was and i think it was true back then that you know nike didn't really care about wrestling as much as those other companies and I would like to say that Nike made a turnaround, but I think it's you and Shane. And I think they just hired the right guys. Uh, you guys work really well together. Shane's, I know a guy you respect a great deal and deservedly so. Uh, he's a, a really great people person. You know, there's, we could do a whole episode on how funny Shane is. <laughs> you know, so, um, but I just, you know, I want to congratulate you guys on just, the literal change of the culture and the perception change that you guys have been able to make at Nike is really impressive in a very short period of time. So that, you know, I and think that's incredible. I think uh, the one thing is, is that, uh, you know, when, with major brands coming into the play, you know, with Nike, with the resurgence within the sport, Nike has a deep history with, with wrestling going all the way back to Wayne Wells, 1972, Kerry Colat, Dan Russell, um, you know, Nike's been around for a long time, but, you know, ASICS was the, the, you know, the flag bearer in the sport of wrestling for, you know, 30 plus years. So yeah. we just want to do our part as many of the other brands are doing. Um, wrestling is very profitable and, you know, the more money that we can bring to the sport and more athletes we can get, the better it is. So I'm very excited about everybody that's, uh, you know, a brand in the, in the space. We're going to be doing really well. So, um, Kudos to everybody, and once again, we're going to have a lot of fun. For sure, man. So let's start out with Cornell University. So Cornell's been in the news, it feels like, on a pretty consistent basis here. Uh, will Rob Cole go? Will he stay? He's going. Does Mike Gray take over? Next day, Mike Gray takes over. Which of the kids leave? It feels like they're all staying now. I texted Mike and... Uh, that looks like the case. I mean, they got, you know, Vito as an Olympic alternate, Dake on the Olympic team. And then they go hire Donnie Vinson from NC State, and they hire Kellen Russell from Michigan. Uh, Mark, I'm going to let you go first. When you heard about those two hires, and feel free to take your time about both of them, uh, what were your thoughts? 
Yeah, I was uh, I was pretty excited when I heard it. I guess what I the one thing that I've noticed is that these young guys, and I'm talking about you know, assist you know the assistant coaches like Poeta, uh, like Gray, taking over the programs, and these are major programs. These guys are hitting the streets running. I have not seen this kind of hustle in quite some time when it comes to trying to change the program in a, in a different direction and really improve what they have already. Um, and it's by the hirings of the assistant coaches that they're bringing in. They're not sitting waiting for something. They're going out and finding people that they want and they're bringing them in. So I think that's a great get for Cornell University. I think Russell's going to do a phenomenal job working with Yanni. And I think that's kind of a big key. That's why they wanted him. Uh, because, you know, obviously Kellen Russell is one of the top wrestlers in the United States for a long time. So, I mean, when you can have that kind of talent in the room and to work with every day, plus he worked with the uh, Michigan RTC, I, I would imagine, quite a bit too. So, you know, and they're trying to get their RTC really going hard. So I think it's a great fit for the college. And I'm, you know, hats off to these young coaches that have just taken over uh, – they're killing it right now, Dave. Yeah. What do you think, GT? Um, I mean, I, I think Kellen Russell's a beast. I think he's a you know a great guy that you know basically you know went into his post collegiate career staying at Michigan. You know, he I mean himself as a wrestler, extremely talented, done it on every level. Um, I think it's a huge huge get for the Cornell staff. And then you know with Donnie, you know he's. He's a, he's a really, really good assistant coach. He's young. He can still wrestle with the guys, continuing to, like, build that young core of coaches. Um, you know, and then once again, I believe he was a uh, – I don't know if he's from New York, but I know that he wrestled at Binghamton. So that will help with, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, in-state recruiting because he has a huge name from when he was competing. Um, so I think not that Cornell needs any more help. They already have a pretty, pretty robust um, presence already, but – you know, it's you, know, you keep up with the Joneses a little bit. You got a young, energetic staff going to make some noise coming back to you know the NCAA season next year. It'll be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I I agree with you guys. I had a couple sort of maybe a different perspective on some of it. So Donnie Vinson is from Binghamton, like you said. He was coaching under Pat Papalizio, and they've always recruited really well there at NC State. We've talked about this. A big part of it is their financial aid situation there. But they were really good at finding kids that qualified for aid, bringing them in, and having these big 10, 12, 15-person recruiting classes every year because they're able to get so much farther with 9.9. <clears throat> One of the reasons why I think they would have hired him, which makes sense, is they're working off a financial aid formula at NC State. Well, Cornell is all based on financial aid. There's no scholars. So – if you have a coach that's used to working off of that formula, now you find lower income kids, you just got to find them with higher ACT and SAT scores, <clears throat> you know, but selling the Ivy League education is, is an easy sell. It'll be interesting to see, we talked about this, where the president of Cornell is leaving or the athletic director, whichever guy that was, and what's going to happen with the Finger Lakes loophole, if that's going to stay open or, or close. Uh, but the Donnie Vincent part, that made sense. Kellen Russell, I believe, first of all, Kellen Russell is really smart. He's been on my podcast two or three times. Um, he's wise, He's an old soul. He's wise beyond his years. When you talk to him, it's not like this dude. He sounds like a 50-year-old just in terms of intellect and his approach to the sport. And, Mark, you made – or one of you guys made a point about the RTC. He he trained with Sergey Belaglazov every day for – a year or so here now, like he's, and Kellen's smart. Like I say this, like smart guys, we steal from other smart guys, right? Like think about Mark, what you and I did. We needed somebody that knew a lot about international wrestling. Go get Grant Turner. <laughs> you know, like go get somebody who's really good at it, who already knows it, who has relationships. So I think him getting to pick Sergey's brain, Kellen already has credibility as a national champion and a, world team member and all that stuff. But you combine that with him studying just the pure technique of Sergey, along with the running the program and the mentorship of a Sean Bourmet. And I think 
you know, he's a guy that's, that's ready. I'm surprised he left because he's a Michigan guy. I mean, I'm sure they threw the kitchen sink at him to get him. Um, but yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because Josh Saunders is up there at Cornell and, you know, I talked to Nolan, his dad, and he goes, do you guys think like this was like shock? He goes, we needed guys. He's like, Gabe Dean left. He goes, Max Dean left. He goes, Rob Cole left. He's like, we, we had to go get big guys to fill these slots. He goes, and there's still a volunteer assistant job available. And he's right. So that'll either be Dake or that'll be, you know, if I think if Dake keeps training, they go get another guy and keep Dake in the RTC. They added Gwiz. So, yeah, I mean, Cornell stacked themselves up very nicely. And I also think young coaches that can wrestle, that's good. But I don't see as many coaches. I talk to coaches nowadays. They don't wrestle much with these guys anymore live from what I'm here. It's a lot of sparring and technique and playing in situations and just getting a feel like, uh, you know, Mark gets a hold of me or you grant and says, all right, let me feel it. Oh, this is where the pressure's wrong. They're not doing 45 minute goes with these guys anymore for the most part. That's what those RTC athletes are for. I mean, that's, that's filled that gap, you know? So, but the Kellen Russell Yanni thing is, is uh, that's smart, Mark. That's a, Kellen Russell about as good as there was at winning close matches. <laughs> you know? So yep. um, I think Yanni might have a little more offense than Kellen did at that stage, but in terms of managing matches, that'll be, that's going to be interesting. So the other big news was Kenny Monday leaving the Tar Heel Wrestling Club and going to the Spire thing, Spire School. And it's in Geneva, Ohio, Grant, you were telling me off the air, telling us off the air. Tell us what you know about this place. So it's like a big, um, like it's like a U-20 um, sports complex. So like they're basically doing all sorts of sports there, swimming, weightlifting, basically. Um, it's kind of like a, like a mini OTC, if that, that might be the best way to basically describe it. I don't think it has any allegiances to the, the USOPC, but it's just this huge – um, basically factory for athletics and they have all sorts of sports that go on there. Um, I believe that they were trying to have this be where, um, where they were going to like do U 23s, but then with COVID they had to move it to Lincoln and all these, of these things. Um, but I mean, the, if you go and check out like their camps and things of that nature, there's post-grad things that they can do there. Um, it's a pretty cool place. Um, and they have some big money and some big names behind it. So um, not surprising that they would go out and get one of the, the very best wrestlers ever from the United <laughs> States to go be the coach there. Um, so, you know, I'm excited for what Kenny can do at that facility because it, it is such a brand new position and facility. And you're in the heart of wrestling right over there with Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. You know, it's going to be it's going to be really, really cool to see. So... I'll ask this and then Mark, whatever you want to say, I apologize. Is it a school that you go to or you just go to a school near there and then you train there off hours? I believe that there is an academy and I think there is camps available there. I don't know enough about it to be, um, okay. you know, I'm definitely not going to be their spokesperson, but sure. I think that there is a, a piece of it that is educational. So it might be like a Blair or like a Wyoming Sam type of place. I I would think so. I would do a little bit. I'll do a little bit more research on it, and maybe we can. Okay. Yeah, maybe it out, but, back. yeah. Mark, when you think about a guy that won everything in the world, literally that there is to win, and then coaching at you know the the college level, coaching at the RTC level, and now you know, dropping down in age. I'm not saying equality, but in age. Mark, when you think about that, that's an awesome opportunity for these kids, right? Oh, without a doubt. And uh, Ohio is already one of the top three states for wrestling in the United States. You know, for high school kids, uh, it's unbelievable the talent they got in Ohio. And they probably really needed something like this to bring in some of the best kids uh, for – you know, training. I'm sure there's a lot of clubs there. You know, the clubs have kind of taken over wrestling. Um, you know, it used to be just the high schools. Uh, it used to be like the kids club where everybody in town would wrestle. And then when you got older, you went into your high school and they went to theirs yeah. and you never saw them again. So 
you know, they've got these things popping up, David. Uh, you know, it's 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 going to be a great opportunity for Kenny Monday because this is going to be his and his alone. Uh, you know, sometimes when you work with other people, you may not get the credit for what you've done. This is going to be his baby. So, you know, if it works, it's going to be because of him. If it doesn't work, then, you know, and I don't think that could possibly happen, but it's a great location. It's a great spot to have a facility like this. I'm not sure it's a, like a Blair Academy. If, if I remember right, I think it's a facility where they hold camps uh, and it's used basically year round and they bring in some of the best athletes and it costs a good penny to go there and train because they do have the top coaches uh, in all sports. They got lacrosse there. They've got football there. They've got weightlifting, like Grant said. I'm sure they got gymnastics. I mean, this place is amazing. And I saw an article on 60 Minutes on it. And it was, oh, wow. It was really one of the coolest facilities I've ever seen. And they kind of went through. And, I mean, this thing is so big. It's like a small city. And they have – it's really neat. So if, he, if that's what it is, and I, I'm not 100% sure – that is what it is, but it sounds exactly like what they were doing on 60 Minutes. It's a really neat facility, and he's going to have some really – he's going to have a good time there working with these kids because everything's first class. Yeah. So, hey, Mark, real quick, just as – I'm going to say something. Your thing is bumping a little bit. We're getting a little bit of static, just so you know. Um, so what's interesting is – and we should have probably circled back on this. There's now a coaching opening at Michigan – there's now a coaching opening opening at North Carolina State, and there's now an RTC opening at UNC, and so the carousel just keeps moving, right? Like, uh, you know, whoever is going to replace Kellen Russell, Donnie Vincent, and Kenny Monday is coming from somewhere, and you know, it's it's the middle of July, you know. So I mean, this and then where that person comes from is going to keep getting filled, so. I mean, you could see this. I imagine there'll be a lot of conversations in Fargo. Usually, these schools already know if somebody's leaving, who they're going to hire, and that kind of thing. You know, I should say this, too, to circle back real quick. Mike Gray's done an unbelievable job in a really short period of time of keeping all those kids happy that, to stay. It, told, it speaks a lot about his relationship that basically nobody left. You know, how much they – and because those kids didn't have a season this year. And, and they're all being forced to be vaccinated. So I know there's people that are unhappy about that. And he managed to keep them all there and then just add a ridiculous staff. Uh, I know Kenny was really close with Jordan Oliver. And so maybe we should have seen this coming when Jordan moved up with Kendall Cross that, you know, maybe the RTC was going to go in a different direction. But, you know, I don't know which one precipitated the other, but it's, uh, it's interesting. So... Let's talk a little bit about Fargo, and I'm going there on Thursday. Uh, Grant normally goes, but he has a higher calling uh, going to my homeland. So, um, you know, <laughs> Oregato. <laughs> so, um, uh, Fargo turns 50 this year, and we're not going to do the breakdown that the other podcasts and the other wrestling people are putting out with all who's going to, you know, who's at each weight and who's going to win, you know, go to flow, go to Rockfin, go to the open mat, go to Intermat, go to all these different places. USA wrestling is putting out the team rosters as they come out. They put out a probably half of them. I just, you know, I look at them every day. I saw Missouri's cause I'm on the Missouri coaching staff. Uh, but, you know, maybe just overall impressions. Mark, I'll let you go first. Did you wrestle in Fargo? And was it no. – it wasn't Fargo then. There was not Fargo. So there might have been Fargo, David, because I am 61. So, I mean, if it's – You were, you was around then. Fargo. Yeah, it's 20 – yeah, you were around. Um, yeah. I did not do I, – I did freestyle my senior year – after my senior year with some buddies of mine that from around the state that I got to know from wrestling in high school. And so – we went to a couple of tournaments. I had no idea what freestyle was. I had no idea what I was doing, but somehow I got into the, I got into the finals against the guy that was, I think, 
placed second in state, pretty good, better freestyler than he was collegiate style. And he taught me a lesson and uh, it was ugly. So <laughs> then my first college match, I turned around my first college match I ever had when I was in, at Iowa Central, we went to uh, Lincoln for, they used to have a big open tournament in Lincoln. And my first match was against Kenny Monday. <laughs> and, uh, I did not know. <laughs> Hold on. You have me and Grant's attention fully now. Grant, yep. <laughs> let's go. That was, that was a lot of fun. I mean, that was, it was really, it was a cool experience. You know, I went out there with the idea that I don't know who this guy is, uh, but he looks like he's pretty good. And uh, man, I went up to try to do some things and all of a sudden uh, my feet were straight up in the air and I just got hit with the fireman's that I never saw coming. And it hurt. I mean, it hurt to hit the mat. And uh, that match didn't last a long time. But I learned from there. So, yeah, I didn't get to do a lot of freestyle. I wish I would have. You know, we we opened our room for freestyle camps. And we always had State of Iowa would come in on their way to Fargo and spend a day there and train. So, you know, I was there the whole time. Uh, and I was just learning. You know, like yeah. you said, David, as coaches, we want to absorb as much as we can. Yeah. Nothing wrong with learning from some of the best guys that know what they're doing. So that part was fun. I know more about freestyle now than I ever did, and I'm 61 now. So it doesn't do me a lot of good, but still, I enjoy freestyle now. And I didn't understand it back then, so yeah. All right, so listen, I'm trying to get good at this media stuff. We're 22 minutes in, and GT, I buried the lead. Mark Ostrander to wrestle Kenny Monday in his first match in college. I've known Mark forever. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. <laughs> you don't Damn. talk about stuff like that, David. Who wants, what? who wants to know? You want to know who else I've wrestled in college? <laughs> no, I, I, want, I want to hear GT's reaction to you wrestling Kenny Monday. I've wrestled some of the best kids in the country you oh. know, back then. And that was a long time ago. I mean, I had a, in one tournament, I wrestled Jimmy Zaleski in the semis. And then I turned around and had to wrestle Royce Elgers for third and fourth. That was in one day. And that was after winning three matches to get to the semis. And they were good matches. I mean, Jimmy only beat me 19 to 10, which <laughs> isn't all that bad. No. I think he beat me. That isn't bad. That's all worse than that. Now, all, ten escape, all nine hey, points. Ten, hey, 10 escapes nine, is good, nine, Mark. <laughs> yeah, nine, nine escapes. But he fleed the mat once, and I kind of questioned that with the official, and Jimmy started laughing, so he wasn't too thrilled. And then Royce beat me three to four, four to three. I'm beast right now. I'm so dead right now. GT, go. Your face is perfect right now. Hey, man, like, it, first and foremost, like, we, we, we start off with, like, being, you know, like, Kenny Monday, one of the greatest wrestlers ever in the history of you know, the United States. And then quite literally, like, Mark down here in the basement being like, yeah, when I first went into college after I started wrestling a little freestyle, I decided that I was going to wrestle Kenny Monday at the first Open. He seemed pretty good at the time. And all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, it turns out he's pretty good. It, I mean, we all have those stories. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean. Wrestling those type of guys is legendary status. So once again, I, it's not surprising that Mark would run into those guys because Mark's a beast. And <laughs> yeah. now he's like, I was never a beast. What are you talking about? <laughs> next time that I'm, next time that I see Kenny, I'm gonna be like, hey, uh, what? You remember Mark Ostrander? You wrestled him <laughs> at the the Lincoln Open, I believe, in the 1926 Open. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, kidding, Mark. <laughs> Wow. I'll tell you a, a, a quick story about getting ambushed. So I coached this all-star team in Missouri. It's St. Louis, Missouri versus Illinois. And we held it at Merrimack when my dad was the coach. And the day of the meet, my dad calls me. I'm in my office. He goes, you want to come up before the meet, get a workout in? I go, yeah, sure. I was like 25 years old. I just, you know, I, I was coaching, but I you know, wasn't competing. Obviously, I obviously had a full-time job. I come up there and my dad's walking around the campus showing John Smith around. And so he's showing them around. And, you know, I knew John kind of, not like I do now. I said, all right, coach, it's good to see you. I, I got to go get dressed. My dad's got somebody for me to work out with. It was John. <laughs> it was John. And they start laughing. And I, I, don't, I don't get it. And, I, like, I come down 10 minutes later, and John's dressed out. 
I never had anybody kick my ass so bad. Like, I don't know about you guys. You know how you like, it's almost like watching, uh, I don't know, like watching football or something. Like, I, they're better than me, but they're not that much better. You know, like, you like, you like watching guys with golf. Golf maybe is a good one. You know, like, just every shot's perfect. I don't, I don't even, it was unbelievable. I think I got taken down 217 times and I got two and he slipped on one, like his shoe slipped <laughs> and I grabbed him. And the worst part of it was, you know, the kids are walking in that I'm coaching and they were kind of, they kind of look up to me because I could beat everybody in the room. And I'm literally just a Japanese mop <laughs> getting you know, drug across the mat in different directions. And my dad would do my laundry up there, like afterwards, like he'd throw it in and, you know, I get, so I go upstairs and I'm just sitting there in my towel, literally reevaluating my life decisions, you know, like, and he goes, I my, my, I love my dad, but he's not a very encouraging person verbally. And he goes, he, he literally patted me on the back, he goes, you didn't do bad. I go, I think I got beat 217 to two. He goes, pat me on the back, goes, you got two. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if he says it's okay, it's okay, I guess. But like you watch these guys and you think they're maybe 15, 20 points better than you. And they're like, no, they're like 900 points better than you. Like, it's insane. So anyway. David, there's a reason we were not Olympic champions. Oh, just so you for understand. sure. But these I'm just are the saying, reasons. <laughs> you get lulled into it. You get lulled into it. So Grant, did, you were obviously a really good wrestler. Did, what was your experience like at Fargo? Yeah, so um, I, I didn't really have a great high school coach getting me into freestyle. So quite literally, like Bruce Burnett had those uh, the USA Wrestling Syllabus VHS tapes. Nice. And that was how I learned freestyle. And then going to tournaments, you know, basically watching what I could because there was no flow. There was no – none of that was around, right? So yeah. you get DVDs or you go to camps or it's basically just word of mouth. So you go to like some other place, learn a little bit. So I learned freestyle through VHS tapes and then loved it so much, started to go, you know, mostly did freestyle, tried Greco a few times, never qualified, but like, I loved it. And I absolutely loved going to Fargo camp where I got to meet all the other great kids from the state of Iowa before and get a training camp with those guys. Cause you didn't really get to have that very much. And then you get to go room with those guys and, you know, train with, people that are very high level that was thinking like that, you know, across the state. Maybe you didn't have that, or I didn't have that at my high school, hardly at all. So, yeah. I mean, I have really great fond memories of, of the Fargo process, like going to regionals, going to the state yeah. tournament, you know, yeah. going to the camp, um, and then traveling with those guys and, you know, like, yeah, just getting around great like-minded individuals. And then when you go to Fargo, there's 3,000 of the best wrestlers you know, in the country. So it was really cool. It was very eye-opening for me when I was coming up through, um, you know, high school. And, you know, now there's like, you know, the whatever it was, the world championships of Tulsa, like national championships. There's senior national, you know, there's so many national tournaments. At the time, it was senior nationals, Fargo. And that was about it. Like for yes. big, 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 you know, national competitions. I remember the brackets being, because it was not like a traditional line bracket, it was the the old like point system. And it was like the straight line bracket where it was just yes. like up and down. And I remember walking over and there's like, you know, 13 pages of our bracket. Yes. You know, it was just wild. So, um, I mean, Fargo has a very special place in my career and like my, my memory banks of all the great things that have happened there. Um, and, you know, with it being the 50th year, I'm sure that there's going to be a really cool couple of pods you'll be able to do, you know, while up there, get some people on record of, you know, the guys that have won it, you know, four or five times or whatever it is in different styles. And, um, yeah. 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 So what's the, best you did, what's the best you did, Grant, at Fargo? I got to the round of 12 my senior year, okay. um, but I got pointed out. So, like, I didn't have enough points and I got pointed out to be an All-American. So, like, there was a couple of guys that all lost at the same time. So, it was, like, basically in that round. And, basically, I got pointed out. And the guys that beat me, one of them got third and the other one got seventh. And then the guy that, basically, I was with point value-wise would have wrestled for seventh and eighth. 
So just like odd man out on that. But I was actually in my junior year, I was like seven and oh, and then I got red flagged for like a skin disease uh, when I was a junior. So I was, I was, I had seven wins, no losses, still rocking day two skin check popped. Yeah. So and that was back when they had like the bigger weight classes too. Yeah. So I wrestled when cadets and juniors were different places. So like cadets were at Michigan. My first year I took second in Greco and third in freestyle. Uh, which gave me a lot of confidence because I hadn't placed at state my freshman year. And then you go place nationally. You're like, okay, I could probably do good at state. I went like two and two and two and two my freshman year uh, in the junior tournament, you know, with the, with the juniors and seniors. Then my sophomore year, I won Greco. I got O-Dub. And then I probably should have won freestyle. I was winning my pool. And I got headlocked with like 15 seconds left and pinned. I mean, it was at good point where, like, I beat Grant, Grant beat Mark, Mark beat me. And because I got headlocked, I was third. So I ended up rest, crossing over and taking fifth. And then my sophomore year, I took eighth in Greco and lost in the round robin. What's crazy about the brackets back then were you had one hour to make weight when your weight class was released. And we had, like, I think 16 guys left, and six of them didn't make weight. It was, it was insane. And we're just running around the uni dome as fast as you can. My junior year, uh, I dislocated my elbow. And my senior year, I didn't go because I was already going to Iowa State. And they had us training. But, uh, you know, I did a lot of training with my dad's college team. So to me, Fargo was really cool because, like you said, Grant, you're part of something bigger. You know, yours was different. Like you're learning off VHS tapes. I, I was blessed. I had a really good coach and my father, especially in Greco, because his judo is so advanced and he kind of knows how to modify that for Greco Roman, but but to be a part of a group like that, you know, and especially, I mean, I was, you know, freshman and just didn't know a lot of kids, you know, because I only started really wrestling competitively in the seventh grade, and so there's still guys I'm friends with to this day that were there, like, and we had guys like Gary Mayab and Mike Haggerty that were on the Missouri coaching staff then, so you know, those are guys I've I've had on my pod now, so it's very interesting, kind of how those relationships grow. Uh, I, I think it goes without saying, if you're a wrestling fan, watch Fargo. You're going to see the superstars of tomorrow. Uh, you know, people show all these flashbacks like six years ago, you know, person X against person Y, and it's now the national finals, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's also where a lot of these MMA guys come from. You know, when I recruited junior college, we looked for a lot of guys that lost in the round of 12, in the round of 16. I think an NAI coach might still be looking at guys in those, you know, those brackets, you know, losing at those levels. Cause if you can beat out a hundred kids. You're probably pretty good. You know, and those all top eight guys are probably all going to D one or if they're not, they will be now. I, I tell people this, the most money you can make as a wrestler before NIL change would be winning Fargo. your, you know, after your junior year in high school, that's where you can make the most money because you know, now they can sign you. And I mean, that's, that's where your stock is at its all time high. So uh, we got about 10 minutes left. And rather than fake dig into Fargo, Ostrander wants to tell a recruiting story or two. I've got at least one funny one that isn't about me, but it's really funny. So <laughs> Mark, the floor is yours. Well, I think, you know, because we talk about recruiting and what these coaches are going through, trying to get good kids in the program. Um, Back in the day when I coached, I had a kid on the team named Stevie Williams. Now, if people don't understand, Stevie was the older brother of Joe Williams, who wrestled at Iowa, three-time national champ, and TJ Williams, who was a two-time national champ at Iowa. Two-time national champ and a runner-up and a runner-up in Juco. Yep. So anyway, I had coached Stevie, and he was a junior college national champ and was OW, pinned his way through the tournament. I had a phenomenal move called the Williams that we named it the Williams because nobody else knew what it was. But uh, when, I, when he had left, uh, TJ was looking at going to a junior college. So we had, you know, talked to TJ thinking we'd had Stevie in the program. He did well that, you know, he'd come and look at us. So we sent him an airline ticket and we uh, asked him to come in and do a visit. And so I drive to Des Moines, which is about an hour and a half away from Fort Dodge. And uh, 
Grant, you've probably seen this before. The plane lands, and uh, TJ wasn't on it. So I called home. I called his home, talked to his mom, and I said, uh, TJ was supposed to fly out. She goes, he was? And I go, yeah. Uh, do you know where he's at? Oh, yeah, he's in bed. So she went and got him out of bed, and he got on the phone, and he said, hey, Coach, I, I'm just going to go to Lansing, California, and wrestle. I, I've already, I just decided. And I go, well, that would have been nice to know before I sent you an airline ticket because back then, David, the school didn't pay for it. The coaches paid for it. You know, we, you yeah. know I paid for the airline ticket. So I was kind of furious. And we have worked with the guy from Illinois to find out who the best kids were. And his name was Quentin. And I don't remember his last name. Qu Quintroy um, Harrell. Harvey okay, Twister. Quintroy Harrell. Yeah, we call him Quentin. So yeah. anyway, he coached the Harvey Twister, you know wrestling program so I called him and this was on a Saturday afternoon because Saturday morning I was in Des Moines picking up nobody from the airport <laughs> but uh so I called him and I said uh I'm looking for a 41 49 pounder TJ's gonna end up going to last and he didn't show up on his flight today and uh he goes well I, I really don't know he goes no I do know a kid his name's Tony Davis he goes he didn't wrestle senior year and I go well, why didn't he wrestle well, he went to Mount Carmel, and they would not pay for his books, and he told them that uh, he was a state champion as a junior, and I think he was second as a freshman or sophomore, something like that. So he's a state champ out of Illinois, but he, he kept losing to the same guy uh, who ended up going to Oklahoma State, uh, and I can't think of his name right now, David. You know who it is. Oh, Reggie Wright. Reggie Wright. Who so, also went to junior college. Yeah, he, he, he stayed in Illinois. And yeah, so, went to Triton. Yeah. yeah, so this is a Saturday. So Monday I drove from Des Moines, from Fort Dodge to Chicago, having never been in Chicago in my life. And we didn't have anything to find out where you were going. You had to read a map. We didn't have all the gadgets they have now, you know. So anyway, I found Milton Blakely was a 25-pounder we had recruited, and – I found my way to his house somehow um, down in Harvey. So, and his mom was a beautician. She stayed at home. So I had to wait for him to get home from school. He got home from school. He took me to Quentin's club. And I walk into this little beat up building that had a gym with basketball courts. But off to the side, they had like three wrestling mats. And they were half mats, but it went the whole length of the building. And I walk into this room and David, there were a hundred and some wrestlers in there. And yeah. from age five to age 18 or whatever. And these kids are doing backflips. They're doing boot scoots. They're doing things I'd never seen before. It was amazing. These kids were very talented. So he left and went with me to Tony's grandma's house because that's the only place that he knew where, you know, we went there. Grandma didn't know where Tony was. But her his his dad, who was divorced from his mom at the time. This is a long story. I'm sorry, guys. Tighten it up. We got six okay. minutes, and I got to tell a story. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they took us to where Tony was living. His mom had moved, so I we go in there, and I sit down, and Tony was sitting there, and his whole mouth is wired shut. He had got beaten up by a gang that wanted them to join his gang, their gang, and he said no, and so they left him in a dumpster, and he was in the hospital in critical condition for almost two weeks. He was in a coma for a week. They didn't even know if he was going to live. So he's sitting there doing homework, David, do, actually had books on the table. He had no idea I was coming because he didn't know anything about us. So he's doing homework. He's sipping out of a straw because he can't open his mouth. It's just wired shut. And I introduced myself to his mom. His dad's there, but he's outside the door. And uh, I said, I'd like to talk to Tony about going to college at Iowa Central. I'd like to recruit him. And she goes, okay, come on in. I love, we'd love to visit with you. So I come in, she lets dad in, and they're divorced, and which is great. And so we sit down, and I'm explaining what I want to do for Tony. And he's sitting there. And I feel bad for him because, you know, he can't speak. You know, sure. he can't even move his jaw. So we get done, and I, you know, I said, uh, I'm going to give you everything that financial aid doesn't cover. You know, I can do that for you. So it won't cost you a penny out of pocket to go to school there. And his mom goes, Tony, you're going to go to Iowa Central. You can't stay in Chicago. You're not going to make it another yeah. year. You're going, to Iowa, you're going to Iowa Central. Dad chirps in and says, I think you can do better than a full ride for him. 
Well, you can't, Junior. You couldn't anyway. Yeah. Mom gets mad. She backhands him, knocks him off his chair. And Tony started. You can see Tony wanting to laugh, but he couldn't because of his brain. That probably would have anyway, hurt, too. Yeah. Long story short, I come home. Tony comes to Iowa Central. Two-time national champ for me. Goes to University of Northern Iowa. Runner-up his junior year. When national his champ his yeah. senior year. Phenomenal kid. Graduated from Iowa Central. Graduated from UNI. Coaches in South Carolina right now and teaches. Was teacher of the year about 12 years ago. Um, one of my favorite stories ever. That's awesome. I'm going to tell two quick stories. One doesn't involve me, which is hilarious, and one funny. So back in the day, you were supposed to fax in the, the scholarship, the, you know, that morning of. Now you can email them and, you know, e-fax them. So this kid goes to visit North Idaho, and he signs with them. And then Mark Lean gets him on a visit to Garden City, which used to be a really good junior college. And the kid goes, well, I'd rather go here, but I already signed. He goes, don't worry about it. He has him sign another letter and literally FedExes it in. So it gets there waiting on the table. <laughs> At the moment, it was supposed to sign. So they aced him out. The, the funny story I have is we signed to Ron Wynn. And Deron Wynn was a game changer for us at Merrimack. People don't know, he, he won Fargo like five times, three-time state champ, fighting in the UFC now. And he had committed to us at the beginning of his senior year. So he goes to Senior Nationals, Virginia Beach. His club coach is Randy Smith. Uh, Grant knows him. One of, one of the best club coaches in America, I would say. So shout out to Randy. And uh, Deron says, Coach, will you sit in my corner with me, sit in my corner with Randy for the matches? I said, well, I need to ask Randy if that's okay, and I need to find out if it's legal. And I said to Randy, I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to do anything. He's your guy, you know, but I'd like to sit here. He goes, that's fine. He's super cool about it. So my dad's the president of the NJCAA, and I call my dad. And my dad doesn't really understand really how good Deron Wynn is and how important this recruiting thing is. And I said, you need to call the president of the whole NJCAA and find out if this is illegal recruiting because I'm not doing it. You know, if there's, it's an audience. Like, literally, everybody's looking down at you. Plus, it got me on the floor, which all the other college coaches hated. So he calls, and the guy says, it's okay. I go, get it in writing. Because I mean, I go, have him send you an email that says I'm allowed to do this. So he has an email. So Deron Russell's his first match. My dad calls me, like, 37 minutes later, he goes, the NJCA just got six calls about you doing something illegal. I go, I did exactly what I told you I was going to do. Now, he wins the tournament. He ends up helping us get Jamel Jones and Aaron Senzi in that same recruiting class. And the funny thing was, like, Jim Ziegler, who's a buddy of ours, he calls me on Monday. He goes, I noticed you didn't say a word during any of the matches. He goes, was that the loophole, you know, that you can't coach them, but you can sit there? I go, no, that's not, it was legal. Nobody ever thought of it. I hadn't thought of it. Deron just asked me. But I didn't coach because out of respect to his real coach you know that's his guy so gt we got one minute left i just want to say one more time safe travels congratulations we're 98 percent proud of you two percent jealous of where you're going okay <laughs> but go do big things say, yeah say hi to shane and the boys for us uh guys thank you so much for listening to us watching listening sharing we'll speak to you all next week